Let's give Prophet Rob a way we're allowed to reach welcome. He's our family. You know, he's, he's one of the few people that come here. Let's let him know we're ready to receive from God. Thank you guys so much. Well, hallelujah. It is so wonderful to be in a hungry house. Say hungry. Man, not every church I go to has an appetite for the things of God. And so it always feels good when a people desire presence. You know, the Bible declares in the book of Psalms, uh, chapter number 16, verse 11, in thy presence there is fullness of joy. Why don't you grab your seats and give God a joyful shout. Before I take off, I want to minister, or I just want, before I take off and minister, I want to give honor to your pastors. Pastor Marco, his lovely wife, and the whole world, the Way World Outreach staff, you guys are phenomenal in the way you care for your people. I am so honored the way that I feel appreciated and loved by all of you, and I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Pastor Marco, your yes is transforming San Bernardino. But your yes is so big, it's now affecting Africa, Mexico, Compton, and Arizona. Scottsdale, right? Or not Scott? Uh, there you go, Stafford. I mean, uh, you guys, watch this. One man and woman's yes is affecting regions, states, nations, the territory of the Lord. I honor the gifts of God that the two of you are. Thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity to be here. And so, Father, we just ask that you would have your way. I step back, Holy Spirit. We thank you that you're already here. And we ask that you would move and have your way. We surrender and submit ourselves under your presence, which is holy. And we're so grateful for the love that is filling this auditorium. But even greater than it filling a building, it's filling us, your temple. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the healings, the prophetic word. We thank you for the comfort. We thank you for your love. May it come and transform us that we would not be shy nor bashful with the kingdom that you have placed within us, but may we open our mouths on the streets, in our workplace, in our schools, on our jobs, and minister the same grace that you've given to us by the power of the demonstration of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your consuming power that has already filled this room. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. In the book of First Kings chapter 19 and verse number 2, we see something manifest. In chapter 18, we see the prophet slay 450 prophets of Baal, God demonstrated his goodness by sending a consuming fire. How many of you know that's the work of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is a consuming fire. The Spirit of God has the power to divide the flames of fires of affliction that have been meant for you. Can you not remember the three Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that stood up when a nation bowed down? They find themselves standing before a king, and the king says these words, Who will deliver you from my hand? Giving them one last chance to bow at the sound of his worship. And I love what they said. They said, Our God is able. <laughs> Can I proclaim to you the able is the action of the Holy Spirit, which is the presence of God. And the Bible says something amazing. It says the king became enraged. He threw him into the fiery furnace. And he's looking down, expecting them to be consumed. But what happened? The appearance of the fourth man. As the presence of the Son of God surrounded and kept a people. Can I tell you what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit not only protects you, but it surrounds you. 
I am here to tell you that you are surrounded by the presence of God. I know we like to say things like, Lord, let me usher in. How can you usher in the spirit of God that dwells everywhere? Can I tell you what happens when we begin to worship? We're not ushering him in. We're making him visible to ourselves. And I'm here to proclaim to you the Holy Spirit is not invisible. He's visible. You just have to learn to recognize who he is, where he is, and what he's up to. And so in 1 Kings chapter 19, we see something unfolding. There was a miracle power that was demonstrated on an altar. And now Jezebel is angry. And what does she do? She sends word to the prophet. And she says, tomorrow about this time, I will make you as one of them, lest uh, something worse happen. And the Bible says something interesting. It says, and when he saw it, he was fearful and he ran. Can I proclaim to you that what Jezebel did, she did not send a message through a carrier. She sent a hit that he recognized that caused fear to strike his heart. Can I proclaim to you that Jezebel beheaded one of the servants of the prophets and when he saw the head of one he recognized, it caused panic to rise up in his heart and it caused him to run in the opposite direction in which he was called to go. Can I tell you that when fear manifests in your life, it always sends you on a journey contrary to the promise. And now that this journey begins to happen, the Bible says he arose and he ran to a wilderness and he said to his servant, and stay here and he journeyed further into the land and what did he do he pulled himself up under a broom tree he laid down and prayed a prayer that he might die say hmm <laughs> the thing that interests me is this he was in the valley called the Valley of Vipers, and he went and laid up under the tree. When you see the tree in Scripture, it is always synonymous with the cross. In the Old Testament, Christ is concealed. He's hidden. But in the New Testament, he is revealed or made known. The Bible says in the reading of the law of the Old Testament, a heart of a man is veiled. But in the reading of Christ in the New Testament, the veil is taken away. Can I proclaim to you that if this man truly wanted to die, he would would have never curled up under a broom tree because a broom tree is the only tree that is known to repel serpents. Can I proclaim to you that when he sat up under the tree, the Holy Spirit surrounded him and began to repel the serpent. Can I proclaim to you that when he tucked himself up under there, though his mind was overwhelmed, his spirit was at ease. I can tell you he felt like quitting, but something happens when the Holy Spirit grabs hold of you. You might say you quit, but you're going to find yourself getting up. Has anybody over this last season been, been announcing, I'm done. I can't I quit. I can't handle this. This is too much. But yet you find yourself rising up, lifting up your hand. That's not your doing. That's the doing and the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to say, rise. The Holy Spirit comes and says, eat. The Holy Spirit will tell you, you're on a journey that might be too much for you. But it's not too much for me. If you've gotten to the place where you feel like I'm done, I quit, I can't, and you're saying the wrong thing, deliver her. <laughs> if he wanted to die in the valley, all he had to do was just lay down where he was. But he doesn't because the Spirit leads him to a safe place. Can I proclaim to you that in life <laughs> there's going to be storms. In life there's going to be troubles. The Bible teaches us the wise man builds his house on the what? Rock. The foolish man builds his house on the sand. The Bible says when the winds and the rain do come, 
The man that builds his house on the rock will stand. Can I proclaim to you that when you have the wisdom to build, that wisdom is not your own. That's the wisdom of the Spirit of God that shows you where to what? To build, where to dwell, where to be housed, where to live, how to conquer. Can I tell you that you think you're all that and a bag of chips? I just want to remind you, you're not that smart. But the spirit of in God that lives within you makes you a genius. Can I tell you that you have a creative nature? You have the ability to see. The reason why most people don't understand the power of worship is because they have not learned to enter in. Here, let me throw something at you. Don't you remember that Jacob came to a place where he wrestled with a man. We know that he wrestled with the spirit of God. He wrestled with himself. The Bible says that God dislocated his hip. Can I tell you what that means? It means that God dislocated Jacob, an old man known as a liar, a trickster, a deceiver, a supplanter. Say, hmm. Some of you can relate to some of those words. God dislocated. It means he put that out of alignment. But what did he do after the wrestling match? He renamed him Israel, who, a man who struggled with God and prevailed. Can I tell you what he did? He dislocated an old nature and he relocated a new man in a new nature. Can I tell you that the word locate, relocate means he moved a man into a new place. Can I tell you he took him out of his flesh and he moved them into the spirit and when he came into the spirit he was a man known as victorious can I proclaim to you if you're ready to celebrate victory all you have to do is move in the Holy Ghost anybody ready to be imparted to anyone ready to move in the spirit of God come on it's so let me hear you world way way world outreach say yes So Jacob was dislocated. Israel was relocated. He found himself in the Holy Spirit. Here it is. In a nutshell, this man by the name of prophet Elijah is dwelling up under a tree praying a prayer. Lord, it is enough. Take my life. Listen to these lies. I'm no better than my forefathers. Lord, it is enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my forefathers. Can I proclaim to you that when you are caught up in fear, you believe that you're alone. But my Bible tells me that the Holy Ghost is a friend that sticks closer than any brother. My Bible tells me that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. David has an encounter with the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit is even made known. David said, Lord, if I build my bed in hell, there you will be by my side. How could a man live through hell without the help of the Holy Spirit? He said, if I build my bed in the highest of heights or in the heavens, there you will be by my side. David had a revelation, high, low, in, out, good, bad. God is always what? With me. How is he with me? He's with me through the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I proclaim to you that the Spirit doesn't come and go? The Spirit is. Can I tell you that on that fateful day in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came, it came and it dwelled. It came and it resided. The Holy Spirit doesn't come and go. The Holy Spirit is. And the moment your eyes are open to where he is, to what he's doing, you will begin to see see the manifestation and the power of the presence of all that he is capable of doing. That's why the word declares all things are possible through the Christ who strengthens me. Can I tell you that you are strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of God is going to come upon you and it's going to change everything in a moment. So now he's laying up under this tree praying that he might what? Die. He's telling us how he has all these shortcomings and he's not better than. Jesus said that if he did not leave, the greater one could not come. Can I proclaim to you, the greater one was, but he had to be revealed. The Bible says the volume of the book is written of me. 
So it's not just the New Testament. It's all Testament, old and new, that speak of Christ. Wherever you see Christ, you'll see God the Father. And wherever you see God the Father and Christ, you will see the work of the what? Holy Spirit. The three are one. They operate interchangeably in different realms, in different places, in different spaces, at different moments to make known the goodness of God. God's voice always brings an action or transformation to those who become aware. Don't you remember there was a man by the name of Jairus who has a daughter that's about 12 years old and she's on the verge of death. The hardest thing to do is leave a deathbed. But this man was so desperate for the Spirit of God. What did he do? He ran and he fell at the feet of Jesus in the synagogue. And when he finished worshiping, he rose up and he said, Jesus, will you come to my house? Can I tell you that the Spirit of God will always follow the scent of a worshiper? Can I proclaim to you that your worship will move Jesus? That your worship will move the Spirit? Your worship will cause the glory, the power, and the presence to manifest? Can I remind you that just then someone comes up to Jairus and says these words don't bother the teacher your daughter is dead I find it interesting that immediately immediately sorrow hits his heart he's overwhelmed and he's what downcast but Jesus opens his mouth because Jesus and the father are one by the work of the Holy Spirit and Jesus says she ain't dead she only sleeping And so he continues the journey and when he gets to the house, there is those mourning and they're all singing a sad song. Everyone is weeping and crying. It's full of what? Sorrow and disappointment. But when Jesus comes, he simply says to them, get out of here. Can I tell you, the Holy Spirit does not dwell around negativity. The Holy Spirit is found amongst those that believe. Jesus said to everyone in that room, Get up and what? Get out. Can I tell you that you need to protect the sanctity of what you are believing God for? It's time to say to the lesser, get up and get out. It's time to dislocate that thing and it's time to relocate the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus dislocated this negativity and he said, come on, Peter, James, and John. Come on, mom and pop. Let's go into this room. And when they go into the room, what does he do? He takes the little girl by the hand. And he says these words, little girl, arise. Can I tell you that he didn't shout it out? Little girl, arise. There would be exclamation points. It tells me that he whispered. He just took her by the hand. It's a frail moment. Weeping has come and filled the room. But when the whisper comes, it has the power to displace wrong emotions. Watch this. Little girl, arise. He whispers. Let me get ready to conclude right now miracle of God in motion the prophet laid up under the tree the angel of the Lord comes to him not once but twice says arise and eat what does he do he arises eats and goes back to sleep when you are defeated you quit when you are fearful you don't want to get up but can I tell you that God is the God of the what double portion Can I tell you what the word double means? It means the God of again and again. You may not rise the first time he touches you, but he is persistent. The work of the spirit does not give up. He will touch you again. And now the angel of the Lord says, arise and eat. This journey that you're on is too great for you, but you're going to go in the strength of this supernatural food for the next 40 days. The reason he announces 40 is because 40 means 
a trial ending in victory. Can I proclaim to you that when you have the Holy Spirit, your trial ends one way, victorious. Your struggle ends one way, with you on top and it beneath you. Can I tell you, your trial is waiting for you to see and understand the power of the Spirit that lives within you so you could put Satan where he belongs, underneath your feet. Is there any... Is there any victorious saints in this house? Come on. And so, say yes. Come on, somebody stomp your feet three times. What? Uh, hey, yes. Here it is, here it is, here it is. It's so amazing. The prophet rises and he goes to Mount Horeb. You know what we often want? We want to go to where somebody else experienced God. We want to go where the Holy Spirit has been evident. We want to go where we don't have to pioneer a thing. We just have to enjoy it. People all over the world are enjoying the labors of a man and woman that has said yes. But there's going to come a day and a time where they say I love you. I bless you. Go. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're going to be, I went, but I didn't realize I was sent by the power of God. And you're going to go with an empty hand. Can I tell you what fills your hand with power? What fills your mouth with glory is understanding who he's taught this whole time. What you've been trained in. What you've been equipped in. When you recognize the message that has been deposited, you can now release it and transform others in the same manner, in the same measure, in the same way. Because you are a son sent with a message. So here it is, the prophet arises at a mountain where Moses had an encounter, an experience. And he gets there and he goes and he hides in the cave. And suddenly, out of nowhere, God's voice in the form of the spirit shows up and says, What are you doing here, Elijah? Can I proclaim to you? That God knew why Elijah was there. But the question is, why did God ask the prophet a question? God said, what? The spirit said, what are you doing here? Because sometimes we end up in places that aren't designed or destined for us. And we will say, it's God. So the Lord says... What are you doing? Did you know that what is an interrogative question? Because God wants you to seek a matter out. Do you realize that God will never give you an answer when you're looking for one? Remember the widow. She comes to the prophet and she says, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know he feared the Lord and the creditors are coming to take my sons to be slaves. She's looking for what? An answer. What does the prophet do? He asks her a question. What do you have in your house? And she gets mad at his what? What? You know I have nothing in my house. God never gives answers because answers are solutions. And if God gives you a solution, you're no longer going to seek. You're no longer going to search. Can I tell you, the Bible says, the heart of a king searches a matter out. Can I tell you that God is trying to tell you that you're a king, so keep on interrogating, keep on asking questions, keep on searching the realm of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God will make known the promise that will change everything. So here it is, the Lord asked a crazed question, what are you doing here? And the prophet says, I have been very zealous for the Lord. That's why I'm here, because I'm zealous. No, you're here because you're afraid. But he mistaken fear for zealousness. He says, all the prophets 
have been killed, and here it is. I am all alone. No, the voice of God, the work of the Spirit is with you. You don't recognize he's always been there. Good, bad, ugly, indifferent. He never leaves you. But the prophet is fully unaware. And then, what does he say next? He says, I am left all alone here. God speaks and says, there is 7,000 that have yet not bowed their knee. So he now says to him, exit the cave, go to the mouth. Can I tell you that when God says go to the mouth of the cave, he's saying to exit. The word exit is where we get the word exodus. It means he's about to cross over. He's about to come through a threshold. This is the moment where everything's going to change because the spirit is going to be made known to him. Elijah thinks God is going to kill him because that was his last prayer. Lord, it is enough. Take my life. God says, you're here because of fear, not because of jealousy. Go out and stand at the mouth of the cave. Stand at the entrance. And Elijah goes there, and what does he do? He takes his prayer to leak, his mantle. Every Jewish man, when he believes he's dying, he wraps his face in his prayer shawl because he wants to die with all of the prayers prayed. So Elijah takes his mantle. He puts it over his face. He covers his ears, his mouth, his nose, his eyes, and he puts his hands over it to hold it in place. And the Bible says, and the Lord passed by in a wind, an earthquake, and a fire, and he was not in any of those. What does a wind do? A wind will cause something that has no root to tumble. What does an earthquake do? An earthquake will cause what is built but not built stable to crumble. And what will a fire do? It will burn up anything that is not pure. Those are all things that the Spirit does, but God was not in any of it. And then suddenly there comes what? A whisper. The question is, can you, Wayworld Outreach, hear the whispers of God? How are you? You know what's so funny is I whispered. I didn't tell them to whisper back, but they whispered as their response. Say, hmm. Here's my second conclusion. The word whisper means a voice with no bass tonations in it. When somebody plays an instrument such as the bass, it's not an instrument that you hear. It's an instrument that you what? Feel. Anybody like to bump the bass in your vehicle? <laughs> Women with long hair and bass bumping, what does their hair do? <laughs> hair dancing. Why? Because the bass is a vibration that you feel. Your hair responds to the feeling of the atmosphere that it creates. Say, hmm. So God is now speaking in a form in which he took the bass tones out. Because the bass in a voice, a bass instrument when it's played, it's not something that's heard, it's what? It's felt. When God begins to whisper, what is he doing? He's taking you out of feeling, removing you from the realm of 
emotion. He's bringing you to a settled place. Remember how I started off. Have any of you been feeling overwhelmed? Have you ever been saying, it is enough, take my life? And one lady cried out and she said, Lord, it's me. That was all what? Feelings. What was she being moved by? A feeling. The same feeling that moved the man by the name of Elijah in the wrong direction. A feeling called fear that caused him to say to his servant, who's his helper, the one that's supposed to be there standing by his side. When his servant heard the word, stay here, he wasn't a servant like Elisha because Elijah said the same thing to Elisha. Stay here. The Lord has sent me from Gilgal to Bethel. He said, as long as there's breath in your soul, I will not leave you. He recognized his assignment. When you don't understand your assignment, you what? You walk away. And you have 10,000 excuses. You know what the word excuse means? To exit the cause. When you don't have a cause, you quit. When you don't have an understanding of your purpose, you make excuses. So you don't have to. And you say, I'm good where I'm at. You're not. You need the Holy Spirit to come strengthen you. A friend that sticks closer than a brother. One that will breathe on you, inspire you, whisper, and instill hope. Here it is. The prophet is standing at the cave. The Lord moves wind, earthquake, fire, then in a whisper. Can I tell you that many people are trying to hear the voice of God and they want to hear it like a thunder. They want to hear it booming and roaring. But you get all these soft little thoughts that run through your mind while you're praying and you go, that's me. You're not that smart. That's the Holy Spirit. At least that's what my my father told me. He's like, that's not you. You were praying. The Spirit of God came and gave you an idea. The Holy Spirit whispered to you. He's teaching you, showing you, revealing to you. And you keep going, no, that's not the Spirit. The only reason why you're saying, no, that's not the Spirit, that's me, is because you don't recognize Him who lives on the inside of you. So it tells me you need to come to the altar. It means you need to come to worship and you need to... Become sensitive to his presence. Can I tell you, one of the places that are forsaken is the place right before you, the altar. If you can't hear the voice of God, it's because you believe the lie. The word of God teaches us in the book of John, the 10th chapter, my sheep hear my They hear my voice and they won't follow a stranger. Can I tell you that the voice of the enemy has a different frequency than the voice of the spirit of God? But if you tune yourself into the ways of the world, you can't hear him. Remember old transistor radios? You get that fuzzy station and all you have to do is and then boom and suddenly Spanish songs come in like wait 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 that's not it right but that's what we have to do we have to learn to what fine tune where do we fine tune ourselves or where does God fine tune us say in the storm see you thought the storm was coming against you but the storm was actually sent for you Because you know what the storm will do? The storm will cause you to pray. It will cause you to listen. It will cause you to sit still. And it will cause you to hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit. How many of you are ready to hear the whisper of God? Come on, if so, say, oh, yeah. Here it is. My last three verses. So your storm ends. 
Isaiah 43, 31. God will what? Renew your strength. You will mount up like wings of eagles. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not faint. Did you know that that word renew means to make strong? It means to vitalize or energize. When God is talking about an eagle, he doesn't change. And so in this scripture, we have taken the word wait as to tarry. But that's not what the word wait there means. We've also taken it and translated wait like a waiter. That's not what the word means. If it's talking about an eagle, then you have to learn to wait like an eagle. When an eagle is waiting, he's waiting upon the storm to fully manifest. Because the eagle is not excited when the storm is brewing. He's excited when the storm is in motion. And what he does is he waits for the edge of the storm to come near him as he's perched himself in the highest place. And when he waits, he's waiting with expectancy because he realizes the storm is going to do one thing. It's going to take him higher than he's ever been. Can I proclaim to you... <laughs> That God is whispering to you in the midst of your storm. But if you don't understand what he's saying. Because all you focus on is what you're seeing. You're missing the whisper. Eagles are found up to 20,000 feet above sea level. When storms are brewing. Did you know that eagles have like an airplane mechanism where their wings lock in and they wait for the edge because they don't flap in the storm they soar? Can I tell you the reason why you have no strength in the midst of the storm is because you're trying to do it in your strength and the spirit of God saying, do it in mine. <laughs> Psalms 92, 12, second way out of a storm. <laughs> The righteous are like a palm tree. And they what? They stand. You can't stand in your righteousness. You have to stand in the righteousness of the spirit of God that dwells in you. The palm tree bends but does not break. It can withstand hurricanes because it's deeply rooted. Can I tell you, the deeper your root, the fresher your fruit. And the last way you overcome the storm... Is by learning to speak to it. Jesus had said to the disciples, get in the boat and what? Let us cross over. Say us. Us implies you're not alone, more than one. When Jesus said, let us get into the boat and cross over, he was in the same boat on the same journey. What happens? A windstorm arises. The Boat is taking on water, and Peter takes it upon himself to wake up Jesus and say, Do you not care? Question When does the Spirit of God ever stop caring? Never. Peter is so caught up in circumstance that he can't see what the Spirit of God is doing in Christ. What was the Spirit of God doing in his son? He had him at rest. When you think of rest, the first thing we think of is what? <sighs> Peace. Well, there was a storm. Jesus was at rest. Did you know that the second definition of rest is this? The portion that God allotted for you to obtain that you didn't know was available. God has something available for you on the other side. But the only way you're going to cross over is if you could do what the Spirit of God is doing in Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. What was Jesus doing? He was sleeping because he already had a word that said, cross over. You know what happens when we get into a storm? 
We say, I need a word. No, 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 no. You have a word. I need a word. No, you have a word. Let us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in you, let us cross over. I need a word. Yes, let us cross over. No, I need a word because all I see is a storm. I don't see the Spirit. I, I need a word. No, you have a word. Quit looking at the storm and trust the Holy Spirit. But no, I need a word. No, no, no. Trust the Holy Spirit that is living and dwelling inside of you. He's whispering. You know what happens when you're super loud in emotion? You can't hear. So the reason the prophet wrapped his face in the mantle was because he cut off all distractions. He couldn't see. He couldn't hear. He couldn't taste. He couldn't speak. And his hands were occupied holding. All of his sensory organs were what? In use. But his spirit could still hear. Jesus is awakened from his sleep. I don't know when he heard it. I just know he heard it. When he was disturbed from his rest, the spirit of God must have already spoke to him. Peter's in a panic. Jesus, do you not care that we're perishing? Jesus gets up, stretches, and what does he do? He speaks. Peace be still. He spoke what the whisper had already told him. What did the whisper tell him? Let us get into the boat and go to the other side. He was disturbed, but his peace still remained. My question to you tonight is this. Where is your peace if it's been disturbed? It's in the Spirit. It's in the Holy Spirit. Watch this. When Jesus said, peace be still, he closed the door on the wind and the waves had to obey. God has given you the keys of the kingdom. Did you know that your mouth contains the power of death and life? If you speak what the spirit is speaking, you'll speak life. If you speak what your flesh is speaking, you'll speak death. Do you realize that the word key is a word that does not mean to open? The word key is the Greek word kleis, which means the power to lock. The reason you have a key gives you the power to lock your house, to lock your door to your car. It gives you the power to lock your phone. Why? Because you have the key that can open it. So the word key doesn't mean to open. It means the power to lock. The word to lock, when you study it, means the power to neuter. Can I tell you that you need to hear the voice of God in the form of the whisper because it gives you a strength to close the door to things that want to intimidate you and bring forth fear. Here's how it ends. The storm ends. They cross over. How does it end for the prophet? The Lord speaks to him and says, Arise and return by the way of the wilderness of Damascus by which you came. Can I tell you that the Spirit of God is trying to help some of you complete some unfinished business, but you're saying, give me a new word. He's saying, return, because when you do, you'll discover your assignment. The prophet thought he was dying that day, but guess what he heard? Go and anoint Elisha to be the prophet in your place. Can I tell you that he received an assignment that lasted for 2,190 days, 52,560 hours. For six years, he was given a brand new assignment. He thought his day was over and God gave him a six-year assignment to train the prophet in his place. I said all that to say this. You're in training to hear what the Spirit of God is saying so you can empower somebody to have a ministry that will last for decades. Isn't it ironic the prophet trained him for six years. 
Elisha's ministry spanned 54 years plus the six years of training, 60 years, six decades. Can I proclaim to you that the Spirit of God is telling us there's much work at hand. But who's willing to go? I thank God for the people for Africa. I thank God for the churches that are being launched and sent out. I'm so grateful for a man that has a vision to help you hear God's voice. Because there's so many people that believe they can't hear God's voice. Today you are his sheep. And if you're not, this is your moment. Maybe you're here and you don't know the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're here and you're caught up in fear and chaos is running your life and you want to get off the chaos train. Today, if you need out of the storm, you can rise above it, stand through it, or speak to it, and it'll end. Or you could just simply say, Jesus, come into my life. And he'll give you the power to overcome. And so today, if you need Jesus, you've never received him as your personal Lord and Savior, but you would like to know him. I just want to let you know, this altar is open. Come now. Just rise, get out of your seat, and come. <clears throat> this young lady with her arms folded, sitting behind Pastor Armando, will you just rise? Yeah, you. <clears throat> Unless you don't want to hear what God's saying. You know what? You need to get out because you're trapped right now in life. Come out. Let her out. Let her out. Let her out. <clears throat> Can somebody help her maybe come up on the platform? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, man, church, this is a moment to stretch your hand. She's going to encounter the Holy Spirit. If you've never received Jesus, here's some prayer warriors that would love to pray with you. Stand before them and please minister to whomever comes. What's your name, dear? Hi, Chantel. Just lift up your hands. I want you to close your eyes because you need to get lost in presence. You know what? You're overwhelmed right now. <clears throat> And if I need to hold your hands up, I will. Chantel, this is what I heard the Spirit of God say. You're not defeated nor deflated. The cause is not lost and the purpose is not far. He said, it's hidden within you. He said, today I'm going to dislocate all of your pain. And I'm going to relocate healing in your mind and in your heart. God says, I'm going to take away anger and disappointment. And I'm going to bring your life into a place of divine alignment. There's times the Lord shows me <clears throat> that you're having an argument in your mind and no one's there because you're so afflicted because of the past. And this is part of the chaos 